Welcome to Itasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series Season 2. I'm Shirley Legering, your host for today. We have a whole new lineup of speakers and topics this year, and I hope you will enjoy some of them. Itasca Waters is a nonprofit whose goal is to educate residents in Itasca County about how to keep our water clean for both the environment and the economy. We have been teaming up with like-minded people and organizations for about 14 years now. And you can read all about those projects on our website at itascawaters.org. If any of those sound of interest to you, please consider becoming a member or a volunteer to help produce programs such as this. And we thank our partners that's showing on the screen right now for their support in producing this program. Here on the next screen, you see is a guide for today's program. Dr. Sass will speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions from you. You can submit a question, and all you need to do is click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can do this at any time, but, and we will read the questions at the end on your behalf. We will not be using the chat function today. This program is being recorded and will be available on our website for viewing at the itascawaters.org. Finally, we value your opinion, and so please click on the survey link at the end of this program, or you will re receive the survey by email, and we thank you for filling those out. Today's presenter is Dr. Gregory Sass, and the title of the program is Water Plants and Woody Debris, Friend or Foe, and, spoiler alert, fish will be involved. Dr. Sass earned his BS degree with honors in biology, magna cum laude from the University of South Florida, Florida in 1999. He earned his MS and PhD in zoology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Center of Limnology in 2001 and 2004, respectively. He is the former director of the Illinois River Biological Station with the Illinois Natural History Survey from 2006 through 2011. And from 2011 through 2015, he was the Northern Lakes Fisheries Research Scientist and Northern Unit Fisheries Research Team Leader with the Wisconsin DNR. Currently, he is the Fisheries Research Team Leader in the Office of Applied Science with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. His uh, research career has focused on conserving and enhancing within lake habitat for fisheries sustainability. So here is Dr. Sass. Take it away, Greg. Thank you very much for the introduction, Shirley. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for tuning in uh, this afternoon. Uh, but again, thanks so much for having me today. Um, it's a real pleasure. And I hope you'll enjoy the content of my presentation this afternoon, uh, where I'll be talking about water plants and woody habitat in shallow water, friend or foe. And so I'll begin by uh, showing everyone the strike through on debris here. Uh, through our research on the subject of structural habitats within lakes, um, debris has often been looked at as a negative connotation for habitat within um, structural habitats within lakes. And so we tend to prefer to use the word coarse woody habitat or woody habitat uh, when discussing these structural materials in lakes. And I hope through my presentation uh, today, I'll be able to show you some of the importance uh, of why this is good habitat and important habitat for aquatic ecosystems. And that's why I've also underlined friend here instead of foe. Um, and again, my presentation will hopefully make some of that clear based on our research efforts over the years. I'll also preface this talk by saying, um, I know the plan was to potentially talk a little bit more about water plants, uh, but today's presentation will be largely focused on coarse woody habitat within lakes, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that I might be able to um, about aquatic macrophytes and the similarities that they have with coarse woody habitat and aquatic ecosystems um, at the conclusion of my presentation today. So to begin with, I, I really like to highlight um, why we are really interested in structural habitat within lakes. And I don't think we would maybe care as much or know as much about the influences of that structural habitat without a couple of really influential studies. Uh, the first by Christensen et al in 1996 um, showed clearly that the amount of coarse woody habitat within North Temperate Lakes tended to be higher in lakes that were um, 
less developed. And likewise, if we look at the Marburg et al. study here on the right panel with coarse woody habitat density um, in logs per kilometer on the y-axis or vertical axis and building density um, on the x-axis or horizontal axis, we can see with those data points that um, there's a clear negative relationship between the amount of lakeshore residential development and the amount of woody habitat that's found in the littoral zone of North Temperate Lakes. And so I think these two studies really set the stage for uh, a much larger body of research to understand the influence of lakeshore residential development on littoral zones and lakes and how that relates to coarse woody habitat and also to aquatic macrophytes. Um, I but I'll also say when I'm talking about aquatic macrophytes, I'm talking about what we might commonly call weeds within lakes or submerged aquatic vegetation. And with coarse woody habitat, what we're talking about here are the trees, the logs, the sticks, the branches um, that are found in water bodies that derive from the shoreline or riparian zone of lakes. And from these two studies, um, some of the first work related to uh, the influence of woody habitat on fish populations and fish communities in lakes uh, we're really somewhat related to fish growth. And so I'll just highlight two studies here, one by Daniel Schindler et al. in 2000 um, that showed that the growth rates of largemouth bass and bluegill uh, were significantly higher in lakes with more coarse woody debris or coarse woody habitat in their littoral zones. And so we can draw the correlation there of lakeshore residential development, less coarse woody habitat, and then likewise to these growth rates uh, that were found in these two important sport fishes that uh, many anglers target, target in North Temperate Lakes. The second study I'll highlight is one from my own PhD research, and this took place on Little Rock Lake in Vilas County, Wisconsin. And here we simulated the lakeshore residential development process by curtaining a lake into two separate basins. And on the northern basin, we physically removed coarse woody habitat from this basin and reduced it from 475 logs per kilometer down to 128 logs per kilometer. So about a 70% reduction to test for fish community responses to the simulation of the lakeshore residential de development process or loss of coarse woody habitat. And in the reference basin, which is shown um, on the, the bottom of those two panels, we left this as a reference or a control system um, to monitor fish community responses against our coarse woody habitat removal and the basin that we left alone. And so it was about 344 logs per kilometer um, in this lake. In Little Rock Lake, it was primarily largemouth bass and yellow perch. And what we found for growth rates through this uh, whole lake experiment was that the size specific growth rates of largemouth bass um, significantly declined compared to the reference basin after we removed all the coarse woody habitat. A follow up to that is a second part of the study that I just talked about on Little Rock Lake and then another one um, looking at the response of the yellow perch population uh, to this whole lake coarse woody habitat removal. And in the left panel here, we're showing the density of yellow perch and the number of fish per hectare. R signifies the reference basin, T signifies the treatment basin where we remove coarse woody habitat, and then our pre and post time periods. And in the reference basin where we didn't remove any woody habitat, Habitat, we see that the yellow perch population remains strong. In the treatment basin, the yellow perch population basically became undetectable to our standardized fisheries gears. Um, and so essentially it was uh, a functional extirpation or collapse within the system. And this was a result of intense predation pressure by the large mouth bass population in the system because the yellow perch no longer had refuge habitat um, in association with that coarse woody habitat. And also because yellow perch tend to use coarse woody habitat as a spawning substrate. I'll talk about this in a little bit, but they lay their egg skeins or ribbons on coarse woody habitat to help um, maintain oxygenation in those eggs and to help with development. In the right panel here, this actually was another whole lake coarse woody habitat removal that took place on the reference base in a little rock lake, except in the early 2000s in northern Wisconsin, we were under a severe drought and many of our seepage lakes were reduced in water level by about three feet. And so on the reference basin here, Mother Nature essentially removed 75% of the coarse woody habitat from Little Rock Lake naturally through that drought and lake level decline. And what this figure is depicting here is the catch per unit effort of yellow perch. And as you can see here, as that drought progressed from 2003 to four to five, and then was really intense in 2008 
and nine, we saw the exact same influence on the yellow perch population, essentially a functional uh, extirpation of the population from the lake, likely for the same mechanisms that we observed in our physical removal experiment, uh, of course, with the habitat on the treatment basin. So why do we lose coarse woody habitat from lakes? And there's a number of reasons why this happens. Uh, one, plain and simply, is natural, vari natural variation. And so the riparian forest composition surrounding a lake can have a major influence on the amounts or input of coarse woody habitat that's naturally coming into systems, such that longer lived trees, such as conifers, oaks, maples, they're not going to be as frequent contributors to uh, inputs of woody habitat within lakes compared to maybe aspens or birch trees, longer, uh, shorter life species, softer woods. Uh, there's also decom decomposition that takes place. And just through that lake aging process, um, that wood could be in a system for a very long period of time in our cold north temperate lakes. That degradation process can be slow, uh, but it does happen over time. Decomposition decom occurs. It happens more quickly in our softwood species. It takes longer in our hardwood species. But I think maybe even more importantly are the anthropogenic effects or the human induced effects on coarse woody habitat loss in lakes. And so, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, this is related to shoreline development. Um, often this takes place from physical removals by lakeshore residents. Um, often we like to have clean littoral zones um, that are free of obstructions, nice beaches. And so uh, in surveys that we've conducted, many lakeshore residents have said that they remove woody habitat basically as soon as it enters the, the water uh, to maintain a, a would be called maybe a clean littoral zone. Deforestation is also another process or a human induced process. And so um, by creating dwellings and other structures around our lake shores, this clearly oftentimes uh, results in a decline or a removal of the riparian forest there. So it tends to um, take away natural inputs as a result of that. I discussed the physical removal from lakes. I talked a little bit about the water level declines and you can see in the picture um, on the lower mid portion of the screen here, this is what Little Rock Lake looked like during the droughts. You can see much of that coarse woody habitat's been left high and dry and unavail unavailable to fish and aquatic, uh, other aquatic organisms within the system. Beaver control is another factor. Beaver are very good at um, rapidly adding woody habitat to lakes, whether it's in their food caches associated with beaver lodges or just felling trees into water bodies so that they later um, chew off those limbs and use them for their lodges, food caches, um, or for food. And then also fire suppression. Um, so many of the trees that we removed from Little Rock Lake and that experiment had fire scars to them. Uh, but in today's day and age, and most often when we have a forest fire, our job is to put it out as quickly as possible. And so um, that input, of course, woody habitat to lakes has certainly changed over time with our practices. And why is coarse woody habitat important for fisheries? And I'd like to focus on you know, starting at the base of the food web. And really the big part of woody habitat and how it influences aquatic systems starts with the, the slow degradation of this woody habitat because it provides a slow release of nutrients over time. And this slow release of nutrients I like to call this is a good natural release of nutrients. This isn't excess um, nutrient loading through fertilizers or other human activities that we do on the landscape. This is a natural process and um, aquatic organisms and fish are adapted to this process in North Temperate Lakes, such as those in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And this nutrient release stimulates periphyton growth, another healthy, healthy aspect. And that's what I've highlighted in, in the two pictures here. So in the picture on the left, we can see this beautiful structural habitat in a uh, Vilas County Lake in Northern Wisconsin. Uh, we can see the aquatic macrophytes. We can see the coarse woody habitat and structural complexity. But one of the things that's really important here outside of that is the green film that you can observe growing on that log under the water. Likewise, if we look at this beaver lodge on Little Rock Lake before we removed it, in the bottom portion of the picture, you can see the food cache associated with this beaver lodge, and you can see all the periphyton growing um, on that food cache um, in association with that beaver lodge. So then this periphyton um, subsequently attracts 
grazing benthic background vertebrates. And I've shown a few here in a trichopteran or caddis fly and uh, a, a juvenile or a larval um, dragonfly larvae and odonate here. And those benthic invertebrates then attract predatory, I'm sorry, then that paraphyton attracts the grazing benthic invertebrates, which then attracts the predatory benthic invertebrates, which then attracts fish such as bluegill and yellow perch um, and, and other panfish that heavily rely upon uh, benthic invertebrates for a prey resource. And then that's, of course, woody habitat attracts piscivorous fish and anglers. And so if we look at coarse woody habitat within lakes within a food web context, we're really setting up a situation where the structural habitat is serving as a micro ecosystem within the larger lake ecosystem itself. Other mechanisms or ways of course woody habitat is important, um, certainly include fish attraction. And so uh, this was a study that was conducted in 2005 and it looked at the branching complexity and the fish species use in association with that. And basically the findings of this study suggest that the more complex the woody habitat is within the system, the more fish species it will attract. And in general, uh, many fish species are attracted to coarse woody habitat and use it for various reasons. In this study, there were 16 fish species observed in several Northern Wisconsin lakes and the branching complexity and the type of tree mattered um, in this particular case. Of course, woody habitat is also important to some of our North temperate species for spawning and as refuge habitat. And so, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, in the case of yellow perch, um, you can see that in the picture here on the left. If you see the little kind of white ribbons that are in the upper portion of the photo, um, those are yellow perch egg skeins. So those are their egg masses. Uh, those are spawned in early spring and they're often draped over aquatic macrophytes and coarse woody habitat, as I mentioned, um, such that they're not on the bottom with the potential to not be oxygenated and then uh, and, and later not hatch as a result of that. Likewise, in the right photo here, we can see a smallmouth bass using what's called a half log structure. These are another form of habitat enhancement that's been used in lakes. And in this case, smallmouth bass often like to build their nests in association with these structures as nest garters and uh, nest garters protecting their eggs and their young, uh, the males in the case of this species. Um, they can often use this as kind of a, um, a what do I want to say, kind of a protective side of that habitat where they don't need to defend um, compared to the rest of the nest. And smallmouth bass aren't the only ones that spawn in association with woody habitat. Uh, bluegill, black crappie, and largemouth bass also do um, as well. And I really think from this overall body of research of understanding the influence of lakeshore residential development on woody habitat and lakes to some of the studies and the results that I just showed, uh, this is where I'd say really fish sticks were born. And when I talk about fish sticks, this is Wisconsin's, um, this is what we promote for fish structural habitat enhancements within lakes. And when we talk about fish sticks, we're talking about bringing trees from an upland source, so away from the riparian zone of the lake where the structure is going to be added. So bringing it from an alternative upland source down to the lake and then distributing this coarse woody habitat in the littoral zone of lakes, commonly in bundles, um, to serve some of the purposes or functions that I just mentioned. And so we call these fish sticks. It's kind of a, a fun little thing that was coined when we were promoting um, some of this work. But this is really what Wisconsin has heavily focused on as far as structural enhancements with woody habitat and lakes. And in all cases with these structural habitat additions, um, again, I'd like to focus on these microsystems, uh, micro ecosystems. And so Again, these structural habitat additions are intended to serve as micro ecosystems within a larger ecosystem or lake context. And the goals of enhancing habitat um, are things like slowing the lake aging process uh, to potentially increase fish productivity and fisheries quality, which include things like uh, fish abundances, uh, the size of fish within a population, and then also their catchability. Because uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier in the talk, not only does this coarse woody habitat attract uh, fishes and benthic macro invertebrates, but it also attracts anglers. Often anglers know that these are places where uh, their catch rates might be a bit higher. And I also want to talk a little bit about the lake aging process. And so 
lake aging, um, and I've got reservoirs and natural lakes pictured here, um, has resulted in declines in fish productivity over time. And when I'm talking about fish productivity, I'm basically talking about the carrying capacity of the amount of energy within a lake to support fish populations. And it's often measured as a rate, like the kilograms of fish per hectare per year. And in thinking about this aging process within reservoirs and natural lakes, uh, when a reservoir is generally first filled, uh, fish productivity is pretty high. And then over time through various processes, that fish productivity um, is degraded or declined. And this happens because of eutrophication. It happens because of sedimentation. It also happens because of a loss of habitat uh, through degradation over time. Um, but I really think there's a strong correlation from what we've observed in reservoirs of our natural lakes, that in our natural lakes, these common inputs of coarse woody habitat into systems in the longer term has been what's driven our fish productivity. And there's been several studies that have shown that fish productivity has declined over time. And so these structural enhancements um, in many ways are used to kind of stem that aging process to keep our fish uh, community productivity high. Um, within these systems. And to take that a step further and you know, some of the, the research behind that aspect of what's driving our fish community productivity in North Temperate Lakes, um, this study was really interesting and one that we're continuing to work on in an experimental fashion. And then I'll talk about that one in a little bit. Um, but a study in the early 2000s by Mike Pace and several of his co-authors co um, believe it or not, interestingly, found that about 50% of the carbon in largemouth bass in a North Temperate Lake in Northern Wisconsin was derived from terrestrial sources. And so this is really in interesting in the fact that it's suggesting that carbon that's coming from leaf litter during fall, from leaves falling into, the, into our lakes and degrading, and of course woody habitat that's within systems or is input into systems, has a really strong influence on lake food webs influencing fish productivity. Um, interestingly enough, the lake that one of the lakes I'm currently based at right now in northern Wisconsin, when we do the food web models and track energy in the system, about 50% of the energy has to come from terrestrial sources of carbon in order to even drive the fish community productivity or food web within that system. So in our north temperate lakes, these annual inputs of good nutrients and carbon coming off the landscape are incredibly important drivers of the amount of life that we have in our lakes. So when we're thinking about some of these littoral habitat enhancements, it's really important to focus on what might be constraining fish productivity and is habitat, habitat a limiting factor. And so it's important to think about um, the fish community within the system and whether doing so may influence reproduction by providing spawning substrate for some of those species that I mentioned previously. Uh, will the enhancements influence growth? And so this, matters because of food quality versus terrestrial versus aquatic and the quantity of food that might be available, also foraging conditions and prey encounter rates, and then just overall our survival mortality and recruitment of fish populations. And if we think about those things and habitat is limiting, then we tend to, to think about some of these enhancements in lakes. So I'll just show two um, examples here of natural materials and artificial materials that are often used to enhance uh, habitat and lakes and reservoirs. For natural materials in the upper left picture here, uh, those would be considered uh, fish sticks in this case. So those are brought from upland sources and placed on the ice in this reservoir in this picture. Uh, we also use fish cribs to an extent and that's kind of the little log cabin structure that's based there. Often these are sunk in slightly deeper water after being placed on the ice so they don't become a navigational hazard. Um, and then in the lower left, um, this is uh, the project I'll talk about in just a little bit. These are tree drops. And so these are uh, a situation where the group that we were working with wanted to keep things as natural as possible on the lake. And so these were trees that were felled into the lake from the riparian shoreline. Uh, on the other side, um, not really the case in Wisconsin because it's illegal according to our state statutes, but there's many reservoirs and uh, sometimes lake systems that are often using artificial materials. And so oftentimes these are PVC structures, um, um, sometimes they're considered uh, recycled materials by vinyl siding. You can see corrugated tubing and PVC in the one picture there. And in all these enhancement 
tools. They're constructed to maximize surface area uh, for that paraphyton growth that I talked about earlier to enhance those bottom-up effects into the food web. Um, I will mention here, uh, just for the sake of the group and listeners, that these artificial materials might be considered, um, but in some places like Wisconsin, well, we can't use these in our water bodies. And if anyone has any questions, I point you to a really interesting paper that just came out uh, that basically did a comprehensive review on these artificial structures and constituted and, and basically suggested they constitute nothing more than littering within our lakes. So next I wanna talk uh, briefly about a case study, um, a current project that we're working on right now. This is the whole lake addition, of course, Woody Habitat to a Northern Wisconsin lake. Uh, this was the picture of the tree drops that I talked about with natural materials in the previous slide. Uh, but we're working on a lake in Sanford Lake. It's in Vilas County, Wisconsin, so north central Wisconsin. Uh, the lake is 92 acres in surface area. It's 51 feet deep. And in the summer of 2018, after several years of monitoring the fish community and the limnology and water quality of the system and other aspects, um, we dropped 160 trees into the lake of various species and in various configurations. And our idea here was um, to experimentally test whether these tree drops increased fish community productivity. And again, when I'm talking about fish community productivity, we're talking about the carrying capacity of North Temperate Lakes, uh, how many fish they can support, and it's typically measured in kilograms per hectare per year. And so prior to our course Woody Habitat Edition in Sanford Lake, we could see in the fish community production that Sanford Lake and Gray compared to range-wide estimates was very low. Um, this isn't uncommon for North Temperate Lakes, uh, but it was a low productivity system. And if we look at some of the species comparing to range-wide estimates um, in Sanford Lake versus uh, those others, we can see that a lot of the production was locked up in walleye within this system, it was, and there was relatively low production of smallmouth bass, yellow perch, and bluegill uh, within this system. So uh, most of the production was locked up in the top predator in the system of walleye. So we're about five years out from adding these 160 trees to Sanford Lake. And so I quickly want to discuss some of our initial results from that experiment. And over the past five years, we've noticed significant increases in the abundance of bluegill and rock bass within the system. We've seen pretty stable population abundances of some of the other species, including muscalunge, yellow perch, walleye, and smallmouth bass. Um, I know this is just the sample size of one, but I like to show this picture of this 41 inch muscalunge that we caught um, last year in our spring sampling efforts out there. Uh, this fish had grown eight inches in four years since uh, we added the trees to the lake. And this is a real anomaly. Uh, most of the muskie in the system are very small, maybe topping out at about 32 inches. And so is this just even a slight indicator um, that this is increasing fish productivity within the system? And we've been also monitoring a lot of behavior aspects to these tree drops. Um, and we found some interesting results. We have been using radio telemetry to track uh, muscalunge, walleye, and smallmouth bass on the system. Uh, we would have expected that these species would be immediately attracted to the woody habitat. They have been to an extent. We've also found some interesting results in that they've increased their movement patterns since we added this woody habitat to the system, which may suggest that uh, the structure is serving as very good refuge for some of the small fish within the system in that micro ecosystem context, um, and that they might be needing to search a little bit more um, as a result of that. And so we're going to keep an eye on behavior uh, to see how that might change over time, if this is a transient response or if this is something that's going to be maintained within the lake. I think even more excitingly is we've just run all the fish community productivity metrics for Sanford Lake after the first five years post course woody habitat addition. And we've seen some very interesting results that support our hypothesis based on, on some previous research of increasing fish productivity. And so in these graphs here, um, in the red, we have bluegill, and we can see that bluegill production has increased greatly from about one kilogram per hectare per acre or per, uh, per year to about 10 kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, we haven't seen much of a change in muskie yet. We've seen rock bass in the green production increase. And then uh, we haven't seen a lot of change in smallmouth and walleye, smallmouth bass and walleye yet. And yellow perch is, is showing a little bit bit of signs of increasing production um, post adding these trees. And if we put that all together to our main question with this study, has fish community production increased as a result of those tree drops? Uh, the answer is it's increased greatly. It's actually quadrupled. Um, so in the first three years, our 
total production within the system was about two to three kilograms of fish per hectare per year. Now we're up around 12 or 13 kilograms per hectare per year as far as our fish community. So at this point, our hypothesis is supported that by adding this wood, we increase the carrying capacity of fish within this lake. And now we're going to continue to monitor this study in the longer term, potentially even up to another 20 years, to see if that energy that's in the bluegill, the rock bass, and the yellow perch then transfers up to our sport fishes of smallmouth bass, muskellunge, and walleye in this case. To kind of wind down here so we have plenty of time for questions, um, I think it's important just to talk a little bit about consideration for these structural, and habitat, uh, structural enhancements in their impl implement, uh, implementation within systems. And I really think what's most important here is the ecosystem context, because this is what's going to influence the type of habitat addition that might be used as far as materials and shapes, and then also the spatial considerations. And so the scale and location where we might be adding this structure. And so important things to think about here are lakes and reservoirs, uh, the trophic status, is this a highly oligotrophic or nutrient poor lake, or is it a eutrophic lake where productivity might be driven um, by uh, excess nutrients versus habitat within the system. It's also important to Think about the recipient community, what fish species are there and how might they benefit or in some cases uh, be negatively influenced. What's the watershed land use in the system? And then also some considerations maybe of latitude or the duration of the growing season and how the structural habitat uh, will in influence fish populations in that context. The deployment location can also be important based on whether uh, we're doing these sorts of things in lakes versus reservoirs. And so as far as spatial heterogeneity in natural lakes, it's primarily related to depth. And in our north temperate systems, structural habitats such as aquatic macrophytes and coarse woody habitat are largely restricted to the littoral zone. And those are the more natural uh, places where we find these habitats and that might dictate what we do with our enhancements. If we're thinking about reservoirs, um, there could be some things to consider here because of the longitudinal downstream gradient from riverine to dam portions that might become important. And temporal heterogeneity is also important. So uh, typically in reservoirs, we might see more extreme annual fluctuations in water level uh, compared to natural lakes, even though drought can do that in some natural lakes. And then also thinking about connectivity to the watershed, uh, which is much higher for reservoirs and has a stronger influence of land use practices in the watershed. And when we try to think about, you know, the magnitude and duration of responses of these actions that we're doing on our lakes as far as enhancements, um, again, it's really important to think about our recipient fish community. So which species will respond or are being targeted with these enhancements? Um, do their life history needs, are they associated uh, with things that we might do uh, to manage aquatic macrophytes or coarse woody habitat? And do the interspecific interactions or the interactions among those species constrain, constrain productivity in relation to what we're, uh, what we're trying to, to do or benefit our lakes or keep them healthy uh, through these activities? As I mentioned, latitude, so the duration of the growing season and winter severity can have some influences on our decisions. Uh, the trophic status, including things like water clarity, dissolved oxygen and prey availability, and then land use along the shoreline and within the watershed itself. And lastly, I just want to you know, mention that there are social, ecological, and governor, governance factors that may um, influence the type of habitat enhancement type and placement. And so things that we could commonly think about were fishing pressure. And so does the predicted increase in fish productivity outweigh angler attraction and associated harvest that might occur? And then also the view on natural versus artificial materials. And as I mentioned, from a governance perspective, like the state of Wisconsin, uh, you know, we cannot use artificial habitat enhancements uh, within Wisconsin lakes because it's state statute um, that we do not litter within our water bodies. And so, again, some things to think about if uh, you're a, a lakeshore resident or you're part of a lake association and you think structural habitat enhancements uh, might have some benefits uh, for creating and maintaining a healthy lake environment. And with that, I'll end um, and be happy to answer any questions. It's been a pleasure being with you today, and I hope we can continue the discussion uh, for the remainder of the time. And I'll just show these two pictures here, uh, which I found pretty interesting. Sanford Lake is the one that we're doing the tree drops on. You can see the nice natural riparian zone and natural shoreline um, versus another 
uh, situation here in northern Wisconsin where um, we can see that in this newly built house there has been clearly the uh, deforestation of the riparian zone to build this structure and a lot of clearing all the way down to the lake shore and interesting after Interestingly, after I took this picture and fishing this lake, we had about a two inch rain event and I can't imagine what it might have looked like in the water um, in the lake after that rain event, given that was all bare dirt there all the way down to the, the lake shore. So I'll end there and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you, Greg. That was very interesting. I'll have a whole new perspective next time I'm out on the lake fishing. <laughs> Excellent. So. Now we'll go to the Q&A portion of this program today to uh, uh, Bill Granches will host that portion. He's the director of the Itasca County Aquatic Invasive Species Program and a longtime board member of Itasca Waters. Take it away, Bill. Thank you, Shirley. Wow, <laughs> another great program. Um, Hello everyone and welcome to the question and answer section of today's program. Now please submit your questions in writing using the Q&A icon. Uh, we are not using chat here. Um, I will read the questions out loud and then they will be answered by Dr. Sass. Now we may combine similar questions and we may not get to all of your questions. So if that's the case, please, please feel free to email us and we'll uh, get those questions answer for, answered for you as soon as we can. Okay, so let's begin. Our first question for you, Dr. Sass. How do you measure fish populations and monitor movements? Excellent question. And I'm glad I can see the Q&A here too, Bill. Um, so thanks, Karen, for the question. Um, so I'll take it in two parts. How do we measure fish populations? And so in a lot of these studies, we do what's called mark recapture population estimates. And so this involves us going out typically in the springtime and we'll set some nets and we'll capture the fish that we're interested in. And when we capture those fish, we'll give them a, a tiny fin clip that basically says that we caught that fish this year and we'll continue those netting efforts and taking a look at those fish that we've recaptured with the, the clip. And then we continue marking other fish with a clip. And then towards the end of that, we'll often do an electrofishing run. And so we use electricity just enough to kind of stun the fish and be able to collect them. Uh, we'll put them in a tub within our electrofishing boat. They quickly recover. And then again, we'll look for the number of fish that we've marked and the number of fish that are unmarked and we can use some long-term equations that will provide us with a population estimate for those species within the lake and so that is often how we're measuring fish abundances is through those mark recapture population estimates um, sometimes we'll use proxies for that uh, so relative abundance estimates where we'll use catch per unit effort so it might be we electrofish the entire shoreline of a lake and we collect all the species um, that are available and then we can say something like we caught 10 largemouth bass per hour of electrofishing and we can use that as a relative abundance estimate uh, within systems. Um, your question about fish movements is another excellent one. We do this in a lot of different ways. Um, the ones that we've been commonly using now are radio telemetry. And so we'll implant a radio tag within fish, and then we can take the frequency of that radio tag and drive around a lake and triangulate where that fish is located. It doesn't tell us how deep the fish is or, it's, or if it's close to the surface, but it tells us the location within the lake where um, that fish is residing and how it's moving around. Um, for those of uh, for those folks uh, on the webinar today that have pets, if you're familiar with a microchip that often gets placed in um, in our, our pets in case they get lost and recovered to get them back, we do the same thing with fish. And so those passive integrated transponder tags, we also place those in fish that we're studying. And we can use a series of antennas and receivers to track fish movement around the littoral zone of a lake, for example. When they have that tag and they pass over that antenna, it tells us you know, exactly what time they passed over it. We put two antennas together so we can tell what direction they're moving. And so in the case of Sanford Lake, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of detections of the fish and how they're using the littoral zone of the lake in that wow. process. Um, and then wow. we also use something called acoustic telemetry. We will put a tag into a fish. That tag is constantly emitting um, a frequency. And then we have receivers that are on the system that pick up that that tag when it's nearby. And so we can kind of track whole lake fish movements that way. And so um, all in all, we've, I don't know, made a lot of advances in uh, understanding how fish move about a system. Fascinating, fascinating. 
Okay, next question is, how does adding woody brush affect the other species besides fish like avian species and mammals? Wonderful question, Elizabeth. And I, I didn't use the picture in my presentation today, and I probably should have, and maybe even mention this. I spent a lot of time talking about fish and paraphyton and benthic macroinvertebrates that use woody habitat. But there's all kinds of species that use woody habitat and they're adapted to it in our natural lakes. Loons build their nests on coarse woody habitat in some cases. Uh, other birds will perch on woody habitat um, to rest or to forage. If we think about you know, blue heron, for example, or some of our other water birds, turtles bask on woody habitat that's floating on the top of um, the water yet and, and still hasn't been submerged. And another example I like to do like carnivorous sundew. And one of the lakes I was studying, there was a microhabitat with moss that had grown on this piece of woody habitat that was above the water and is where the carnivorous sundew um, plant was living on that habitat. So um, it's not just fish and it's not just under the water. There's a lot of different species that um, use coarse woody habitat in various ways. I see. Okay. Next question. Spruce budworm, oops, there went my screen. Spruce budworm have decimated fir trees in Northeast Minnesota. And usually when the dead trees are removed, foresters avoid cutting the dead trees and repairing areas. Should we instead encourage felling dead firs into lakeshores? Another great question. I, I don't know if spruce budworm and those dead trees or the spruce budworm himself would have any negative effects in in the water body they probably wouldn't live once they're submerged anyways uh, but at least in my opinion it would probably be better than removing them away from the lake shore because the natural process of course woody habitat inputs would suggest as those trees died naturally on the shoreline they basically have 180 degrees where they might hit the water body as they fall in unless they fell onto the back onto the riparian zone. So it may be something you want to be, um, may want to consider with this spruce budworm outbreak is to not remove that wood and actually fill it into the lake itself for fish habitat and for other organisms. Thank you. Actually, I just, I just love it when you, you're, you're canoeing or, or, or boating on a lake and you've got a shoreline where you've got the naturally felled trees that came down naturally into the lake. I think it just adds so much. Uh, next question is from Ed. Have you attempted to estimate the economic impacts of changes in fish populations in the lakes that you've studied? Yes, in, in some ways, Ed. Um, oftentimes this is done by um, more of our social scientists that are interested in the human dimensions, but we've certainly looked at um, you know, changes in fish productivity, changes in our fish communities and how that influences um, anglers and how they're using guides and, and how far they're driving, um, what that means for our local economies, which are also really important in Minnesota, the fishing um, industry in this case, or just our, our lake use in general and the economic impact of that. And so we have studied that to an extent and, um, you know, with some reasonable certainty there that you know, healthy lakes and what they provide, whether you're a boater, um, a silent sport, an angler, there's a tremendous economic impact of maintaining healthy lakes uh, for local mm -hmm. economies and to provide um, those recreational activities and ecosystem services derived from them. Fascinating. Next question from Ingrid. Is this approach being tried anywhere in Minnesota? Is it limited to smaller lakes or is there potential to use this to replace stocking? Thank you for the question, Ingrid. I'm not sure how much Minnesota is using uh, fish sticks or fish cribs or tree drops compared to Wisconsin. Um, I'm not as familiar and at least to my knowledge, it may not be as occurring as much as it is in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, through our Healthy Lakes Initiative, which is not just course woody habitat, but it's macrophytes and it's water quality. Um, we have now as an agency basically fast tracked the permitting process. So it's very simple for mm. um, a lake association or an individual lake resident to fill out this permit and do these activities. And so we're promoting this as an agency um, to replace that fish structural habitat that's been lost through lakeshore residential development and other processes and trying to make that very easy and cost effective for um, those that might be interested in it. Is it limited to smaller lakes? In general, it's probably more important 
the woody habitat to smaller lakes than it is larger lakes. So larger lakes often their food webs are influenced by different species and different factors. And so Minnesota has much larger lakes in general than Wisconsin does. And so Northern Wisconsin, our average lake might be 500 acres. Um, there's immense lakes compared to that in, yeah. in Northern Minnesota. And so I think in the smaller lakes, it might have a more immediate effect. At the same time in the larger lakes, there's probably certain situations like bays or specific areas of a larger lake where these enhancements might at least benefit locally, um, but maybe not carry up unless it was done in some massive scale in these giant lakes. Um, but again, micro ecosystems within the larger ecosystem is what I would say there when we're talking about the grading of lake um, surface areas and the potential to replace stocking. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that one. Uh, we do a lot of stocking um, as far as our management for fisheries. And I'll, I'll just say, and, and I've written about this, that uh, we can't expect fish populations to be sustainable if we can't sustain or provide the habitat needed to maintain those populations. And so um, stocking will always be a part of fisheries management. I wish we would focus a little bit more on habitat and conserving and providing um, our fish populations and our aquatic organisms with, the, with what they need naturally than trying to engineer our way um, sure. to producing fish populations. Thank you. Next question is from Tim. Does adding, woody does adding woody habitat have a direct effect on dissolved oxygen in lakes? Another great question. Um, on a whole lake scale, no. And so uh, we don't <clears throat> tend to see any differences in the dissolved oxygen concentrations. We've measured all those variables. We've done these experiments and looked at it. On a more local scale, what adding woody habitat is going to do, and we've measured this, it, it happens in small amounts. Um, but that paraphyton is green and it's going to photosynthesize in the sunlight if the water is clear enough. And so that's going to produce oxygen in the day and at night respiration is going to produce some carbon dioxide from that. But overall, there's been no measurable effect on the dissolved oxy oxygen concentration mm -hmm. in these experiments we've done in the lakes. Let's see, we're getting short on time, but we have time for another question or two. Um, here's one from Kevin. Uh, there's been a push that has forest managers moving towards managing riparian zones towards the longer lived conifers you spoke about. This seems counterintuitive to keeping the sustainable supply of woody debris in our waters. Can you comment on this? Thanks for the question, Kevin. Um, that's a really good point. I, I wasn't uh, really aware that that's what uh, the forest management practice was pushing towards. I guess it makes sense in some ways that those trees are going to be there longer. I think the point there is that those trees do still fall into the water periodically. Um, it could be lightning. It could be a big wind event. In those cases, I think then it's best to allow that habitat to remain into the lake instead of removing it um, immediately. And I'll say it too with like the hardwoods, the conifers, oaks, maples, those trees last a long time in our north temperate ecosystem so when we've done um when others have done the research to try to find out how long has this pine tree been in this lake in ontario sometimes 505 or 550 years and even when i was working on the woody habitat removal a lot of that was conifers those trees have probably been in the system for 100 or 200 years since northern wisconsin was logged completely in the late 1800s and 19 early 1900s that wood was just as fresh as the day it dropped in when I took my chainsaw to it, unfortunately. You could still, it still had the sap, you still could smell everything. So it's slow degradation of those species once they do get in the system. So if they do fall in in those cases, um, what our research would suggest is to leave them. Okay. Uh, Wesley asks, what is a good balance between natural shoreline and access to the lake for yards? Another excellent question. Thank you, Wesley, for that one. Um, what I comment on that, I think the key word there is balance. And so, um, at least in Wisconsin, there's been a lot of initiatives of like um, healthy lake shores, where we might try to minimize the uh, human footprint on our littoral zones by um, at least keeping some portion of our frontage more natural. And oftentimes, this is done with native plants and tree plantings, and then again, 
providing that balance by you know having access to our dock or an area where we want to use the water um, that may not be as natural. Mm. Um, but I think what we want to avoid, or at least what the research would point to, is going all the way to the end of that spectrum where yeah. it's basically developed and highly landscaped all the way down to the lakeshore because then you know we don't have the the filtering process of those trees and those plants to filter out excess nutrients that might be running into the system that riparian zone um, creates habitat for many different species of plants animals insects um, and then likewise what goes on into the water from there and so um, i appreciate how you you put balance there because i think yeah. that's where we'd like to be it's it's a it's a difficult thing you have people who dream of owning lakeshore property and to them the the ideal is a perfectly manicured lawn and maybe a sand beach even though that's so counterintuitive that makes our pristine lake so beautiful up here okay have a question for you sure. do you recommend single trees that are spaced or bundles of trees Bundles of trees, great question, um, Bill. So when we do these sorts of experiments, we want to, as I mentioned in the one slide about how branching complexity is important for attracting more fish species and some of the benefits that it can provide to a healthy lake ecosystem. So often what we'll do in these, um, in these additions is we might take five trees and put them in different uh, configuration together and that increases the complexity yeah. and the habitat associated with that bundle. Um, I don't think an individual tree is necessarily a bad thing with branching complexity, uh, but what we've learned in our studies is that that branching complexity and the amount of woody habitat that's in a particular area is what's really important for attracting mm -hmm. fish and then setting the stage for those other ecosystem processes. Okay. Well, I think that's all the time we have for, for question and answers. And thank you to everyone for all those great questions. Now, before we give it back to Shirley, I'd like to let you know that in addition to these monthly series we have on the first Thursdays, Atasca Waters is offering an opportunity to become an Aquatic Invasive Species Detector, AIS Detector. This is a fantastic opportunity where you can learn how to I die, um, I die, learn how to identify AIS and how to differentiate them from their native lookalikes, um, which AIS is of greatest concern to Minnesota waters, best practices for preventing their spread, um, how do you report invasive species, relevant rules and regulations, and how to search for AIS on your own. Now, if you have a substantial interest in the waters of Atasca County and would like to learn more, please go to atascawaters.org. Um, there are some self, uh, there, there, it consists of two um, self-paced modules, uh, online study. Uh, it's required uh, before a two-day online course in the mornings. Uh, that will be nine to noon on June 13th and 14th. That's when the, the two uh, group sessions are. Now, registration opens April 6th. So check back to our ataskawaters.org website uh, for more information on that. And it's a great value. So I, I highly recommend it uh, uh, to everyone. Okay, Shirley, let's go back to you. Okay, thanks, Bill. And thank you, Dr. Sass, for that great program. Lots of information for us to think about. And if you'd like to watch this program again or, or recommend it to your friends and family, a recording of today's talk will be on our website uh, within a few days. And you can find that at itascawaters.org. We would love to get your feedback. And so a link to a survey will be on your screen uh, at the end of this program. And we will also be sending you an email with the survey so you can choose how you'd like to respond. And we would really appreciate hearing from you. Our next program will be on April 6th and our speaker will be Dr. Afton Clark Sather from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Dr. Clark Sather will talk about decreasing your water footprint. I'm Shirley Legring, and thanks so much for joining us today.